Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Well, I was just listening to this um, sermon this morning. Uh, this is actually a pretty good channel. It's Christian Sermons something. Um, I've linked it before on the community tab, some of their videos. And they actually read out sermons from the early 1900s, the 1800s, and even the 1700s. And they did, they've done a couple from the 1500s um, from notable people. Uh, this is Puritan Jonathan Edwards. Uh, they do, um, down here they're doing uh, Sir Spurgeon. They do a lot of Spurgeon stuff. And the stuff these guys talk about, because, you know, we hear people talk about them now and they kind of mock those guys and make fun of them. I, know, I now know why, because if you listen to their sermons, these guys had a very different understanding. I, I venture a guess it was very different than <clears throat> most of the church at that time. These guys were the truth tellers like we are for our time, the truth tellers. Because, and there's just not that many. And just like back then, there just weren't that many. And you go all the way back through the Bible and you can see the same thing happening there. Whenever Jesus was resurrected, because th think about this for a minute. When Jesus was resurrected, how many people did he show himself to? Because only the people that were believers, only those who were saved saw him. But you go back before he died and before he was resurrected, look how many people got saved. It's an interesting little detail that people miss. Thousands were being saved. But how many people did he show himself to? Because only the saved saw him. Only true believers saw him. 500. Of the thousands of people that believed, only 500 were considered believers. It's an interesting detail that is there in the Bible, hidden in the scriptures, that most people never catch. And we have that same situation going on from the beginning of time to now. The, um, the great apostasy is evidently going to be a lead-in to the great awakening, um, a revival that's going to happen. It's, it's supposed to happen after the beginning of the tribulation. And we see that in the chapter 7 of the book of Revelation as the great multitude. A number no one, it's a group of people nobody can number, according to John. Which indicates to me that that was, he was looking and it was as far as he, his eye could, could register. Of just a mass of people. Probably the greatest number of people being saved in all of human history. Now that makes one wonder just how many people were truly saved in the last 2,000 years. When you start to see these com number comparisons... And you can take that all the way back to when Moses led the people out of Egypt. An entire generation was killed off before God delivered them to the Holy Land. Because they didn't believe. Yet they were all were saved. See, these details show me something very, very interesting. They show me that not everybody that believes is actually saved. There's a big difference between believing and being saved. Anyone can believe. Anyone. In fact, for for people who don't believe the Bible is true, atheists and and um, and other groups sure fight awful hard against something they don't believe is true. Reality is, they probably do believe. They're just fighting against it, which is what most people do when they come to faith. <coughs> the reality of it is, is that. If you lead a hundred people to faith in your life, the chances are very high only 10% of them were actually converted. Because that's how the heart of man is. Now, God is merciful. He, we know he has things going on that we don't fully understand. But I want to register something here because this ties to the psalm we're going to pray this morning. This video is, a, is about Esau I hated. And the title is Those Whom God Hates He Often Gives Plenty. And it's very interesting that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of food. And afterwards, and this is mentioned in the New Testament, afterwards, we've actually covered this scripture, afterwards, he repented and was sorrowful, 
but God did not grant him repentance. See, Esau believed, but he pulled away. Esau had faith, but he denied God. So when God denied him, or so when Esau denied God, God denied him back. You don't want me? Okay, I don't want you. See, we can't assume anything. We have to know. That's why you go through the scriptures and you pour over them. And God will open this stuff up to you. Like, just like he does to me and so many others. He will open this up to you. He will show you these things to show you where you stand in salvation. I, I can't even imagine, and I, I don't want to have to, I hope I don't ever have to see it. And I can't imagine somebody who would think that everything was good and everything was fine and then at, right at the, when they stand before him find out that they weren't saved that's got to be horrible the bible says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth i, I don't want to go through that it's kind of a scary thought but we have to remember that salvation is very exclusive it is only for those who truly believe. Now, not everybody who says they believe actually believes. This is a fact. This is a reality. And we have, the Bible is full of examples of it. We have to accept this reality. Now, this particular video, he's talking about how um, God poured out blessings on Esau like crazy. And this, this sermon actually causes you to stop and think about, you know, how God blesses you and what he's blessing you with. Now, because of what he did to Esau, does that mean anytime anybody gets good blessings, that's a negative? No. But throughout the Bible, he, he really pours out the good stuff of the earth onto those he hates, those that are not saved, those he's not going to. He pours it out on them. On his children, he pours out heaven, which won't last forever. See, all those wonderful things of the earth that he's poured out on those people, it's, it's dust. It's all passing away. It's all powder. It's worthless. So is, has he really poured out blessings to them? Not really. He has, but... You look at it in the deeper sense, you can see quite clearly that he just he gave them dust. The things that are eternal, the things that are truly good are with God. That's where we have to go in order to get those things. And it is those things we would be, that will be poured out on us. Will he give you everything you need to uh, live in this world? Yes, absolutely. But if your driving force is just the world's goods, is to have the world's goods and not turn to God and be with God. We know who, where your desire lies. See, these, I don't intend these warnings to come out like this. I don't intend these types of things to come out. This is Holy Spirit talking about these things. I actually had a whole different speech in my mind of what I was going to say, and I'm being led a totally different direction. He puts these warnings in here for a reason. He wants us to stop and think. He wants us to examine. He doesn't want us to assume. He wants us to know. He told, he told hey, let, let's come reason together. Look at your sin. This is what it is. I'm going to do this with it. He doesn't want you to assume anything. He wants you to know you're saved. From that comes peace. From that comes a desire for God, not for the things of this world. Because you realize, I don't need these things. I know people that will not eat canned vegetables. They won't. They must have fresh they're very snobbish in the way they, they buy food. Oh, I have to have this. No, I have to have that. No, I have to have that. I'm totally different. 
What leftovers you got in your fridge? I'll have that for my meal. I don't have to have anything. The desires of a born-again believer change when they come to God. They change in that the things that used to be important to them are now much less important. The things that, that they did that were for their enjoyment were first and foremost in their life. I must go and take care of, I have to have, the, I must do I, all these things. The pair of shoes that I wear right now, which they're starting to fall apart, I paid $12.65 for them. I don't have to have fancy things and I don't want fancy things. I wear clothes that people have given me. I buy them as cheap as I can get them. I just, I'm not interested in this, all this fancy stuff. But that's because my desires have changed. My views on things have changed. That comes with repentance. But when we do that, <clears throat> excuse me, when we truly stop and look and see what God is doing and see where the true blessings lie, everything changes. We start to see that the things we desire aren't necessarily the things we need. But God is happy to give us what we need. And it'll be at the right time. And it'll be in the right way. Because he does everything perfectly. Now we're going to pray this morning. Psalm 23. And I'm going to do it in the Anglican chant. But listen to the word. You guys know this one. This is a very, very famous psalm. The Lord, the shepherd of his, of his people. And uh, it has the famous phrase, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. It's important for us to remember perspective. So many people today put, and we've had many arguments with them, so many people today put too much value or all the value on spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are not where the value lies. Salvation is where the value lies. There are people, and this is evidenced in the Bible, that have had amazing spiritual gifts yet had zero salvation. Where did those gifts come from? They didn't come from God. Yet God allowed them to have some certain things. Because, see, demons can do that too. What your heart's desire is, is what God will give you. And the story of Esau is a great example of how Esau, he just wanted the world's goods. God gave it to him. Okay, here you go. You want that or do you want me? Here you go. The people that are born again, the people that are walking with God truly, their heart's desire is him. So he gives us more of him. He'll give us more understanding of the word. He'll give us a more gracious heart. He'll give us a more patience. He'll give us a, a, a more loving attitude towards others. He gives us him. Food and clothes and houses, all that stuff, none of that is relevant. The Bible talks about that. This is an important. Life is so much more than food and clothing. Isn't that what Jesus said? In fact, we just read that scripture. <coughs> so we have to ask ourselves, <coughs> excuse me, what's more important? Food, clothing, the things the world has to offer, or God. What's more important in my life? I hear a lot of people say, God wants to bless you. Yes. But what blessings are you referring to? <laughs> because the important blessings are the ones of heaven. Because that is where all truly good things are. They're with God, not down here. Yet I know a lot of people who say, oh, the Lord wants to bless you. He wants to give you this. He wants to give you that. True. But what's more important? What we have here? Or what's waiting for us up there? And it's funny because I even run into people that are like, oh, I'm going to have so much gold waiting for me in heaven. I'm going to have so many crowns. I'm going to have the biggest mansion. I'm going to invite everybody over for, for dinner. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it's like none of you have any idea 
what he's actually referring to there. None of you have any idea what that's talking about. But see, the carnal mind puts it in the only perspective it knows, which is material things. The spiritual mind sees what God's really referring to, what Jesus is really talking about. And it's far greater than a house full of gold and a bunch of crowns on your head. What do we do with those crowns? Think about it. We chuck them at Christ's feet. Those crowns are an acknowledgement from him to us of how we walked in this life. But what do we do? We throw them at his feet. Lord, this isn't my crown. This is yours. You're the one that earned this. You walk up there, you walk into heaven, he takes you and you got this massive mansion and you got a storeroom full of gold. What do you think a true born again believer is going to do with it? All these other people talking about all these plans they've made. I'm going to hand the keys right back to him. Lord, this is yours. This isn't mine. You are the one who died on the cross, not me. I'm happy just to stand by your side and sleep under the trees. Because in heaven, you can fall asleep anywhere if you want to. Everywhere safe. Of course, we don't need sleep. But not in our new bodies. Those material things are irrelevant. The material things of this life are irrelevant. <coughs> Food is meant for the body. Clothes are meant for the body. But the spirit is meant for God. This may be sobering for a lot of people. Because a lot of people, God has really poured out on their lives. But what blessings are you looking for? The material blessings, which God gives graciously to everyone. Or the spiritual blessings, which is salvation, which is faith, which is peace, which is contentment, which is strength, which is boldness, which is understanding. Those are the things of the Spirit. Which ones are more important? When I talk about what God has done in my life and the blessings He has just showered my life with, I don't have, I'm not rich, I don't have anything. I drive a rusty old truck. That still needs more work done to it. Live in a single wide trailer. Old single wide trailer from the 90s. But it's in great condition. He, he keeps it for me. Don't have a ton of money at all. <laughs> Not even close. But everything that I need for life is provided. When I'm talking about the spiritual blessing, the blessings he's poured out. I'm talking about the spiritual blessings that he's poured out. He helps me with those things for life, and that's awesome. But it's these spiritual things that I'm giving thanks for. Being able to read his word and see things like I mentioned earlier. Being able to find the gospel being spoken of in every part of the Bible. Being able to discover things that other people have never discovered. That's him opening up his word to me. What an honor. It's such an honor to see these details in here. Now, most people, they, they don't see it. They don't agree with it. Most people give, you know, I get a little bit of flack sometimes for this. Now, I used to get a lot of flack for it. They're like, well, but that's not what this guy or this guy or this guy says. I'm not worried about what they say. I'm worried about what the word of God says. And I made a lot of enemies doing that by people who were supposed to be my friends. Because there were things in there that I saw that were convicting to, to them. Because they were doing things that didn't, you know, align with God's will. That's a blessing. I can never give thanks enough to be able to see those things in that word. And there are people throughout history, all of history, that have had that same type of interaction. There's a bunch of us running around the world right now. There are 
people that have had that, and it is not something that brings favor or or grace from um, from mankind. But it is by the grace of God that we do these things. It is by the grace of God that we walk in the path that we walk. Staggering to think about just what applies to a born again believer and what doesn't. And when you start to see it in the Word, you start to see what, what Christ and what God are really looking for. <clears throat> it changes your perspective on yourself and on others. It can be very convicting. I admit I've had lots of conviction, but it's caused me to change where I walk and how I walk and how I interact with others. Because my desire is to be more like God now that he's showing me what he's like. So he will provide for all of us. But the question is, what do we view as important compared to what he provides. This morning, our psalm for prayer is going to be Psalm 23, the Lord, the shepherd of his people. And this is a very famous one, and we're gonna do it in Anglican chant this morning. And uh, you look at what the, the blessings that God is pouring out on David, and you can see what he says, but you can see there's actually metaphor in here too. There's a lot of referencing in this. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory and to lift you up as our Holy Father in heaven, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, our salvation. Our salvation lies with you. We can't keep it. We can't protect it. We can't nurture it. You, you do those things. You're the only one that has the power to do those things because all these things come from you. Father, thank you for the blessings you pour out on each of our lives. Not only for the physical blessings, for the things that we need of the body or for our families, but the spiritual blessings. Faith, hope, love, peace, patience. A godly understanding, a discernment of what's truth and what isn't. And look at the world in a different way than everyone else looks at the world. To look at material things in a different way than everyone else looks at them. You graciously pour out heaven on your people. You give the world what they want. You give them the world. But when we stop and think about what that is, that this is all going to go away, this is all going to burn up, what are you actually giving them? Temporary things. Temporary things. It's dust. It's pleasure for right now, and then it's gone. The very next moment. You talk about this in your words so much, how we focus so much on the food that we eat, but he's like, the food you eat it and it goes out. That doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of you that defiles you. Because what comes out of your mouth is what comes out of your heart. Your focus isn't on material things. Your focus is on the spiritual things. So we give thanks for the spiritual blessings that you give us. For the physical, yes, because we need that to live in this world, but for the spiritual blessings, the, the blessings that are important, the blessings that show us your grace and your love and show us that you're watching over us, and the ones that give us the ability to talk to others and to help others and to maybe teach others the truth, maybe sh lead them to you for salvation, to stand apart from this world. And be something totally different. It's so amazing. It's amazing and it's terrifying at the same time. It's amazing to see all these things. And to read your word and to find all these amazing little details. That clarify so much. And that expand on the understanding. But it's terrifying at the same time. Because one gets a sense of just how wrong have I gotten it. How, how least, what, how, what level of low understanding do I really have? And it's pretty low. 
We don't know nearly what we should know, but you get the thanks and you get the praise because you are opening those things up to us so that we may see more clearly what's really being said and what the true intent should be. What should we desire? You and all things that pertain to you. Because all the truly good things are with you, not here. That's why we are foreigners in a, in a strange land. We are on a camping trip. We are out here in the wilderness. Awaiting your arrival. We don't belong here and this world knows it. And this world attacks us because of it. Everything about this world attacks us. Father, it is your will that I want to do. And I pray that your will is done in all things. But as far as blessings, I want the blessings of the Spirit. I want the blessings of truth, the blessings of righteousness, the blessings of salvation. And these are only things that you can provide, no one else. So thank you for those. Thank you for what you do for us, the spiritual and the physical. We need clothes, we need food, we need houses. If we have families, we need to provide for our families and you provide us everything we need. Thank you, Father. But those spiritual things, those are the ones we really need. The change of heart, the repentance, understanding. And most of all, your love poured out into our hearts so that we may share that love with others. We thank you for those things too. This morning, Father, I'd like to pray Psalm 23 in Anglican chant. The Lord, the shepherd of his people. May this be a blessing to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Uh, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Oops, I messed up. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is a wonderful psalm because you tell us so much in the psalm. You show us the blessings that you pour out on us and what you make our enemies to see. And every now and then, some of those enemies see the truth and you grant them repentance and they turn. Thank you, Father. Thank you for using us. Thank you for showing us grace. Thank you for allowing us to share your gospel, your word, with the world. Trusting us with this. I pray we, at least a little bit, do it the way you want us to do it. But we know that all we have to do is share. You provide the increase. Though we may not do it perfectly... You make sure all those things work out the way they're supposed to for your glory. Amen and amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless you and praise you. We lift you up. We glorify you. We sing praises to your holy name. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning prayer. That actually is a completely different speech than what I had already had thought about. And this couple of the points that I originally thought I was going to make, I didn't make. The Holy Spirit definitely led me a different direction on that one. Um, this psalm 
look at this song. Uh, you know, you read it, and if you have a carnal mind, you read it and, and you think of carnal things, but then if you have a spiritual mind and you read it, you're like, wait a minute, that, that refers to this, that refers to this, that refers to this. And what's amazing is a lot of the things that are being spoken of in here, the referencing words are used elsewhere, and it tells you what the reference is. And you come back and read this psalm, it's like, oh, this is a, has a completely different meaning to it. That's the whole word of God. That's the whole word of God. When you use the Bible to prove the Bible, you find amazing, amazing discoveries. It's, it's awesome. It's really awesome. God is awesome. Our Lord Jesus is awesome. We can't praise him enough. We can't give thanks enough. We don't fully understand all that's been done because there are things that have happened that we don't know about that he's done for us. But when we get to heaven and we have access to full knowledge, then we will know. And we can spend eternity giving thanks. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I pray you have a wonderful day. And I will see you guys in the next video.